Pro Tools is probably the least understood DAW by non-professional producers out of all the giants in the music software industry. Not to mention that this shit basically is as old as Cubase. But before we get into the release of Pro Tools itself, we need to go on a cursory detour back to 1983. The origins of this program go back six years before it was released with a piece of hardware by EMU called Drumulator. Two young high school age students named Evan Brooks and Peter Gotcher were very interested in Drumulator and thought it had applications way beyond what its current scope was. They created a company called DigiDesign and created a few nifty programs during their time as curious engineers. These led to the inevitable release of their program called Sound Tools in 1989, which would be the precursor to Pro Tools. The next logical step for the two would be to venture into creating a fully capable recording suite only a couple years later. At this point, Pro Tools history differs from many of its peers, mainly because the first version of Pro Tools cost a whopping six grand. Holy fuck. Needless to say, this meant only professional engineers and producers would be using it. The first version of Pro Tools was based on the third party software called DEC, which was made only a year earlier in the first ever multi track digital recorder built for personal computers. The first version, and somewhat still to this day, was heavily based on audio recording and engineering rather than being used predominantly with MIDI like Cubase or FL Studio. And each track had its own fader, effect rack, EQ, and automation as well. Once you were done recording, you could move to Pro Edit, which was the portion of Pro Tools that you can make non-destructive edits, which means the files wouldn't be permanently altered. Looking at Pro Tools from this era is super nostalgic. Its interface perfectly fits within the 90s time period. It would continue to get updated and refined, and only a year later, Pro Tools would get its first update. In this version, both the editor and mixer were merged into a single window to improve workflow. At this time, Pro Tools 2 was the best selling digital audio workstation to date. You were now able to play 16 tracks at once with DigiDesign's new time division multiplexing technology. It was also at this time that DigiDesign had merged with the company Avid, who had previously been big customers from DigiDesign. During this time period in history, music production software was rapidly growing in popularity and competition, with both eMagic and Steinberg, who developed Logic and Cubase, were neck and neck with Pro Tools. At this point though, Avid made a smart move and decided to start licensing their digital audio engine for Pro Tools to other companies to build their programs upon. Only a year later in 95, Pro Tools 3 would be launched alongside a physical piece of hardware Avid made called the 888 interface. It was an audio interface with eight inputs and outputs for people to use Pro Tools with. They also started bundling their own plugins with Pro Tools, including EQs, Reverb, and Dynamics. Something interesting that also happened at this time was the PCI bus standard was being introduced, which is the port on a motherboard that a sound card would go into. Pro Tools quickly added support for this as it was becoming more and more common. Things were looking great for Pro Tools, and we'd only have to wait two years for the next big Pro Tools release. In 1997, Pro Tools 24 was launched. It's a shame companies can never stay consistent with their naming schemes, but at least this name change had a purpose. It was to signify that Pro Tools had a new 24-bit interface. Something extremely nice was added to this version, which was the edit window being customizable. You were now able to shrink tracks you were not using or blow up tracks that you needed a clear look at. Pro Tools did also provide MIDI sequencing, but from my understanding, it was used a lot more for recording, mixing, and editing vocal performances. Lastly, it was finally possible to create automation on any track with pretty much any parameter like EQ, reverb, sun levels, or even any parameter from any plugin that you had. This was a big step up from the previous version where you really only had panning or volume. Two years had passed and we received Pro Tools 5 in 1999. This was a big one because for the first time, Avid had introduced MIDI editing into Pro Tools. This is the version that Pro Tools came into its own as a fully functional DAW receiving a fully editable piano roll with quantization and automation. Not only was Pro Tools evolving quickly, but 1999 would mark the first year that a Billboard Hot 100 number one song would be released that was recorded, edited, mixed, and mastered entirely within Pro Tools. That song was Ricky Martin's hit Live in La Vida Loca, However, up until this point, Pro Tools was essentially only for the big boys who could afford the insane multi-thousand dollar price tag, but that was about to change with the launch of Pro Tools LE, targeting mid-range consumers with a stripped down version of Pro Tools for bedroom producers. This would also be the first version to offer digital licensing with serial numbers, which would become more and more common in the future. 
To give even more tools to engineers, DigiDesign added their first de-async plugin to Pro Tools 5. It was becoming increasingly common to have more and more digital tools to polish the vocal performance of an artist, and automatic de-essing was an extension of that. If you don't know what a de-esser is, it is exactly as its name suggests. It will tame the harsh sibilance from your voice that comes from S sounds. If you've ever watched a video where no mixing or mastering was done to the vocal performance, it's plainly obvious and burns your ears. The next big release would be in 2002 with the launch of Pro Tools HD. It was unveiled at the NAM Show, or National Association of Music Merchants, which is essentially like E3 except for music hardware and software. Over the course of the next few years, Pro Tools HD would mark the beginning of the end for analog music recording and production as it would become an industry standard in professional studios around the world. Something I mentioned before in other history videos is plug-in delay compensation, which would arrive in Pro Tools HD 6. This one feature is essentially required nowadays, and what it does is detect any delay introduced by a plugin and compensates for it, so when you play your project, everything is in sync. At this time, Pro Tools started to become more accessible to non-professional users with their release of the M-Box, which was a USB 2 channel audio interface that allowed Pro Tools to be able to run on almost any laptop. You were able to buy the LE edition of Pro Tools bundled with the M-Box for just $4.95 at the time. Still very expensive, but a big step down from the four or five figure price tag of previous versions. Now, I haven't mentioned this until now, but DigiDesign didn't just make Pro Tools. They were prolific at creating hardware such as sound cards, which would enable Pro Tools to run, but they're fairly expensive. I thought I would mention this because it is a part of their history, but I'd like to focus more on the software. Pro Tools 6 would be a big step for the program, as it was now possible to run it on Mac OS X platforms, which was the newest operating system from Apple. We would also see the addition of a lot of stock plugins from Pro Tools, like a chorus effect, flanger, and delay. Among these additions would be Dverb, which was a non-real-time reverb plugin that was created by Avid, the parent company for Pro Tools. During this time, we would also receive the hardware product called Command 8 from Avid, which was a control surface for Pro Tools that allowed you to control various parameters via a physical device. Only slightly after this, they'd also release version 2 of their Mbox interface that we talked about previously. The next version of Pro Tools would come in 2005 with version 7. However, on its face, it seemed like a fairly minimal update, but that could not be further from the truth though, because while it looked much like version 6, all of the things under the hood were massively changed to be smoother and faster. On top of that, many quality of life updates were included, like creating menus for each window so you could organize your tracks or MIDI. They also added something called an instrument track, which combined both audio and MIDI into a single track, so you no longer needed to make multiple tracks for different purposes. Something else unrelated to Pro Tools itself also happened in 2005, which was Avid's acquisition of Wazoo, which was a company known for making extremely high quality instrument plugins and sample libraries. This is just what Pro Tools needed in my opinion, because they could finally boast a large library of sounds to use within Pro Tools itself. Before this, and somewhat to this day, at least from what I've heard, most people do not use Pro Tools as a production software. Rather, professional producers will make their instrumentals in another program such as Ableton or Logic and then export those projects as stems to then work on them within Pro Tools. In 2008, Pro Tools 8 was launched with a massive interface makeover as well as a bunch of new stock plugins and features. Among those additions would be Elastic Pitch, which was a plugin used to retool the timing of a sample or vocal performance. For instance, if you recorded a guitar melody and found some of it to be off tempo, you can go into Pro Tools and adjust it to be perfectly on time with Elastic Pitch. Probably the largest change though was the introduction of the plugins Pro Tools dubbed the Air Suite. These plugins included over 20 effects such as reverb, distortion, and even a talk box. Pro Tools finally had dedicated high quality effect plugins bundled with it, which was a huge benefit to people not wanting to pay extra for third party plugins. The other main change was the design philosophy of the interface, and DigiDesign was quoted as saying, we gave it a fresh, modern, and slightly flatter appearance and redesigned icons. The last thing in Pro Tools 8 that's noteworthy in my opinion would be the fact that they also started bundling instrument plugins as well. One of which being Expand, which is one of the best plugins for ambient sounds like pads or strings. Avid also decided to drop the DigiDesign brand name and consolidated all the companies that Avid owned and rebranded all of their products as just Avid. At this point, it was pretty clear that Pro Tools was here to stay and had established itself as one of the giants in the industry. 
Only two years later, Pro Tools would come to a turning point with the release of Pro Tools 9 in 2010. The LE version of the program was dropped and the price tag was severely reduced. It was becoming more and more apparent that Pro Tools had competition and other companies were offering very competitive software for a fraction of the price. Pro Tools 9 had everything the LE version did not and now sold for $5.99. Now, you could still buy the HD version for just shy of $2,000, but the non-HD version had plenty of features for even professional producers and engineers to work with. One year later though, we'd receive Pro Tools 10 in 2011. One of the best things added was the ability to use multiple file formats for the same project, such as MP3 and WAV files working together. They also replaced their old TDM format for plugins and created a new standard called AAX. For all you producers out there who download plugins and see that it will always ask if you want the AAX version installed, that's because it's what Pro Tools uses to display their plugins rather than using VST. That's probably my least favorite thing about Pro Tools is that VSTs do not work with it. Even so, it's still a very powerful program and only two years later, Pro Tools 11 would launch. Version 11 would mark the era where Pro Tools now supported 64-bit plugins. This was mostly because they dropped support for their old plugin platform in favor of their new AAX format, which now supported 64-bit plugins. They also replaced the old engine that Pro Tools ran on with a ground-up rewrite called the Avid Audio Engine. This would make Pro Tools far faster and less intensive on your CPU, along with allowing for many more tracks to be played at once. Funnily enough though, there was still an issue Avid was facing, and that was the fact that Pro Tools 11 supported 64-bit plugins only, and no longer functioned with 32-bit ones, which was pretty much most plugins at the time. Slowly but surely though, most third-party vendors would eventually come out with 64-bit versions of their AAX plugins to work with Pro Tools, so it ended up not being a massive issue. I think one of the most important things that happened during this time as well, which was the launch of Pro Tools First, which came in 2015. This was the first free version of Pro Tools ever, which was unheard of as Pro Tools was known for being used by extremely expensive professional studios and being able to mess with the program for free opened up the world of Pro Tools to a larger and new audience. Shortly after that, Pro Tools 12 was announced with the ability to rent Pro Tools for $30 a month if you didn't want to spend the large chunk of change to buy it outright. We also got the Avid Marketplace, which was a library of plugins and samples you could purchase from Avid themselves. This included what they called the 11 Effects Bundle that came with a lot of digital versions of analog effects like a guitar amp and stomp box. And now we arrive in the present day, where Pro Tools has a vast amount of features for almost anyone under the sun. In 2018, they changed their naming scheme again to instead of Pro Tools 13, we got Pro Tools 2018. Each version after that would be named after the year it came out instead of a nice orderly naming scheme. Nothing against Avid, but goddamn is it annoying when companies can't keep their naming consistent. Anyways, over the next few years we get updates like the integration of Melodyne into Pro Tools because it was used very often for vocal editing. Most of the updates would be internal and not visible to the user, but important nonetheless. This video was probably the hardest one to make out of all the research I've done on different programs because its history goes back so far and it's also not your traditional DAW. Pro Tools is much more than that, and it single-handedly changed how music was made in the 21st century. I hope these videos give you some appreciation for the hard work, blood, sweat, and tears that goes into making these awesome fucking programs for us to use to make the music that we love. Thank you guys for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.